So it's one thing to ask if AI use in medicine is ethical. It's another to ask, is not using AI actually unethical? Is it so good that it's actually unethical not to use it? My guest today says yes, absolutely. And that is Dr. Dom Pimenta, and he is building an AI company called Tortoise. The tortoise and the hare, that famous parable, tortoise being the fact that they're doing things slowly, they're doing things properly, they're doing things evidence-based, but they are building AI for every doctor. Now, I spoke to Dom about a few different things. He's got a really interesting background. He's been all across healthcare from uh, well, practicing doctor, core medical training, cardiology, ITU during covid He's been in pharma, so he's worked on CRISPR, which is human gene editing, for those that know. Um, he then joined Entrepreneur First, uh, well, taught himself to code in the meantime, but taught, went to Entrepreneur First, found a co-founder called Chris, uh, who's a machine learning engineer. And the two of them have built Tortoise together, and they're doing some really cool stuff. As I say, building AI for every doctor, but actually not at the end of kind of diagnostics and software as a medical device, which Dom is actually pretty cynical about. It's actually in the space of helping with documentation and summarizing notes and helping with consultations that way. Very interesting, he talks about cognitive load as a mechanism of justifying essentially why technology is useful for the workforce. It's something that I hadn't really considered before. He uses something called the NASA Task Load Index, I believe, something that he found. But it's a way of measuring, I guess, that feeling that a task is daunting or takes a lot of mental energy. Sort of thing that I experienced when I had to write a discharge summary and it takes ages for the computer to load up. You know that going through clicking all the boxes is going to be slow. You're going to have to click it 100 times to even move the cursor through the box, that kind of thing found a way of measuring that kind of burden called cognitive load and actually noticed that tortoise is reducing cognitive load by 60 to 70 percent for those people as well as a load of other metrics that prove how good it is but really interesting episode this one if you want to learn about ai in healthcare um and yeah is it unethical not to be using it apparently yes dr dom pimenta welcome to the health tech podcast sir how are you doing yeah really well thanks for having me Listen, it's a pleasure to have you on, mate. Um, everything you're doing looks really cool. Uh, as you said before we started recording, you're, you're doing this really cool thing called AI, which <laughs> excited to get into that with you, man. Uh, plenty of it around, but obviously you guys are doing it in your own very special way. So looking forward to it. But um, before we kick off, mate, yeah, as I said, uh, talking about the company anyway, uh, it'd be great to get your story. So how does one go through the world as Dr. Dom Pimenta and end up founding a health tech company. Talk me through it. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And it actually comes back to maybe something I'll talk about at the end about this idea that to understand somebody, to manage them in a company or otherwise, you kind of need to understand everything, actually, from the day they started. I'm not going <laughs> to get through that now. <laughs> but I, I generally, I, one of the things that we do in the company is when someone starts, I say, you know, when was your birthday? When were you born? And then what happened? And I find that really useful because people forget. And actually, I would also advise everyone to do that for themselves because it's quite a strange and slightly surreal experience to recount your entire life to yourself. So I'm not going to do my whole entire life, but I'll give you the, the contracted version. Um, so I'm Dom. Yeah, I'm a doctor qualified over here in the UK 13 years ago now. Um, I did the whole CMT didn't know what I was going to do, quit for a bit, got a job as a cardiologist, thought actually cardiology is pretty cool, so came back and did cardiology training, did that until COVID ITU, so I was in COVID ITU for about six months in the first wave, finished uh, training, just kind of done with the whole thing after that, and I went into pharma, so I became a pharmaceutical physician, did that for about two years, that was really interesting actually, I worked on CRISPR, uh, silencing RNA, oh, Cool. was the second ever doctor to consent a human being for CRISPR gene editing. Wow. So like my claim to fame, because the guy who was supposed to do it was sick that day, and that's just what happens <laughs> a lot in pharma life. And that was really interesting, because like you know, uh, if, for those who don't know, obviously CRISPR is human gene editing, so the animal studies actually don't give you a lot of relevant data because they don't have the same DNA, obviously. Therefore, consent is a very odd process because they're like, "What's going to happen? Is this going to happen?" And you're like, "Probably not." Is this going to happen? Maybe not. You don't actually know, and they don't know either. And this guy said, um, "What did he say?" He said, "Am I going to turn to a crocodile?" like really facetiously. I was like, I'm obligated to say probably not. not. 
But I mean, I couldn't actually say no because you don't know. Yeah, and uh, I mean, that's the whole legacy. But anyway, that was going great. And then as sort of, you know, life is want to happen, this black swan event happened and my wife got sick. And she's fine now. She's back at work. She's a surgeon. But at the time, and I had to stay at home and be actually just a stay at home dad slash something else. I've got three kids. So that's a whole nother set of stories. And that something else became an AI healthcare academic. So I learned to code, machine learn, did my own data science, ran digital trials in liver disease and heart failure. Started to think that actually health tech was getting beyond that point it'd been a gimmick like let's be honest it's been a gimmick for like mm. a decade and only maybe in the last five or six years has it become reasonably powerful reasonably adopted to think actually this might need this might mean something different for us as a profession like this might actually be something different that we then have to learn and practice and professionally i was just it was really cool like you i learned to code and thought oh wow i can talk to computers which is like obviously for anyone who's vaguely techie that's a really dumb thing to say but i just never really clocked that coding meant you could tell computers what to do directly and you didn't have to think about software so decided that might be a quite a good when i was still sort of relatively pluripotent i guess in my career again having left a cardiology number to choose to do something different. So I decided to either go deeper into pharma and become like a health tech CIO, AstraZeneca or Roche or something, or found my own thing. And I thought I'd try the latter first. It's like pragmatic way of doing things. So I got into an accelerator called Entrepreneur First, which you may or may not have come across before. But for those who don't know at home, Entrepreneur First is a little bit like uh, <laughs> Love Island for tech nerds. That's how I describe what, it. What so a descriptor. <laughs> what a descriptor. Yeah, if the comms lead for EF right. is listening, that is an outstanding oh, that is an outstanding new way to describe what they do. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that was it's super interesting. So what they do is like you want to found a company, you're an individual, you have an idea. So my idea was AI is kind of cool. I mean it wasn't really well developed, let's be honest. And I got into an accelerator and I met my co-founder there, Chris. So Chris Tan is a machine learning engineer. He's a uh, research scientist, um, former research partner at DeepMind and Google Brain. And he'd always worked on this thing that we'd now call AI agents. So using AI to control computers. Um, and he was essentially teaching AI to use software. So it can like, you know, use your word, use your email. It's doing some boring stuff and advertising and customer support. And I was like, well, actually, I hate using the EHRs. Can we can we do that? Like, is that a thing that we can do? And that's kind of where we started, like this idea that you could give over all the sort of digital crap to a AI agent basically to take over. But then, you know, if you expand that one step further and say, okay, well, now doctors everywhere, in fact, clinicians everywhere are going to work alongside AI. And I really do think that now is the case, not so much six or seven months ago, but now definitely. Then actually, there's a whole bunch of other AI out there that just never sees the light of day. And I saw all of this when I was doing my academic stuff. So I went to conferences. I went to a conference in Sweden. They presented this great model that said, you can predict with 90% accuracy who's going to be readmitted with heart failure in 30 days. And as a cardiologist, I was like, wow, I can think of five great interventions off the bat. Give, it, give me the model, USB stick. I've got the patients waiting when I get back to London. Let's go. Let's do it. Like, what's the plan? And they were like, well, we're not going to do anything with this because we're data scientists. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that gap, I think, interestingly, it used to be an academic interest gap. How do you go from translation? Now I think it's becoming a moral imperative, right? Mm. There's models out there that can actually give us life-saving information. And that's a great example. Who's not going to do well in the community on their mm. diuretics, on the regime, and end up back in hospital because they have a kidney here, they have another EF here, and actually that would probably be a terminal event if they do end up coming back within that time period. Therefore, that literally is a life-saving model that we should be mm. deploying everywhere. Like everybody should be desperate to be using this stuff. Mm. And yet there's a huge, huge, huge gap. So yeah, so we'll talk about tools a bit later, but that's my story and that's what we've been, that's what I've been sort of bashing my head against the wall uh, doing for the last nine months. Thank you, mate. Um, first thing I want to ask you about is you've had a very decorated career. You've covered lots of different things, obviously ending in entrepreneurship and doing what you're doing now. Um, whether it was the way you told it or whether there's something more to it, but you seem to have navigated different industries with relative ease in terms of moving from even, even to go right back CMT to cardiology, ITU, then bigger moving into pharma, dealing with wife sickness, stay-at-home dad, then whilst doing that, 
ambition is or, or boredom is <laughs> making you learn to code and uh, machine learning, yeah, data science, yeah. then you're thinking, hey, I'll just give entrepreneurship a go. You apply to EF and get on a relatively decorated accelerator and achieving there. You're certainly very high achievement in order to do all these things. But what's driving you to do all these things? And, and, and your adaptability here is worth noting as well, like your, your ability to kind of move to all of these different places and flourish. So is this a mixture of extreme competence, ambition, ability to learn quickly, like what what is it that's allowing for all of these different movements and driving you to all these places? Hmm, that's a really interesting question, and maybe I should lie down and just get on the couch. <laughs> um, I don't. I, I, it's really interesting. I, I tell you, I tell you in reverse order, like my sort of mental. Yeah. Like I've always been that guy, right? Always been not the achieving guy, like the annoying guy. I oh, sorry, I should have really caveated that. So. From day dot, like in even at medical school, you know, there was rag going on. Like I got into medical school, mm. raising give was happening. I was like, oh, I want to be involved in that. So I was just like turning up, organizing things. Mm. Everyone's like, who's this guy just organizing things? He's not even part of rag and he's just helping. And I don't know why I always felt that need to like just like get involved and, and do things. Later in life, I diagnosed myself with something called high functioning anxiety. So there's a subset of people who get very anxious and their response to anxiety is to do stuff. Mm. And when I look back at a lot of my past behaviors, like, okay, new environment, medical school. Okay, what am I going to do? Okay, I'm going to found something. I'm going to do something. I'm going to like act. And whether or not, you know, in the long term, that's like a good or bad thing. I don't know. But so, certainly someone who's never been able to stay still. But more interestingly, I think someone who's I'm just naturally disruptive. I don't know where I get that from as well. My parents are not particularly rebellious people in the traditional sense i guess mm. well, they don't listen to anyone but maybe that's probably where i get that from but always just like looking at the world with i guess quite objective eyes and mm. actually that, so that is true so if you want to go super deep back so like i'm half indian half irish right mm. i grew up in a very very white part and in fact mostly retired part of the world which is uh, in the south coast a, a little town called emsworth so when we were kids we were the only like brown family in the entire village i was like the only brown kid in my school so we were always like you know i had a great upbringing don't get me wrong had loads of good friends very little racism actually experienced in general but always felt like i was the other right never had a tribe never experienced group thing because i didn't really have a group um and that even though it's not like a sad story it's just the reality of and you see this a lot actually in founders people who've never really fit in anywhere mm. like international school kids is a really good example and actually chris my co-founder also grew up in lots of different schools as his family moved internationally um and that's because so you don't have a high so you learn not to necessarily think for yourself but you just don't develop those instincts where if everybody's thinking something i'm going to think that too and fit in because for me it was never really an option like if i felt all that i didn't really fit in so there's a very unique perception and when you come into all sorts of environments like the university environment I remember when I first started my job as an F1, right? This was 2012, Wexham Park, special measures, great tri you know, trial of fire. Mm -hmm. And the take was on a paper list. I don't know if anyone remembers this. Uh, you know, I saw 20 patients, don't know where they are, wrote them all down on a bit of paper. I was only on acute med for three months. That list got lost three times. 20 patients, sickest in the hospital. No one knows where they are. No one knows what the plan is. I was like, this is like mad. Yeah. This is you know, this isn't 1992. This is 2012. We have internet. We have computers. We have phones. You know, like it's just crazy. And I was like, why don't we just have a spreadsheet? And instead of waiting for someone to say, yeah, let's make a spreadsheet, I made a spreadsheet. And we used. I tried to get people to use the spreadsheet. And then IT came down, and they were like, "What are you doing? You can't use the spreadsheet. It hasn't gone through governance." And I'm like, "What are you talking about? It's a mm. spreadsheet. Like, well, what are you actually like? What is it that you think mm. that you are going to come here?" I'd say that would make any sense other than <laughs> this like group think idea. Everything has to, you know, everything has to be this way because that's the way things are. So I've always been disruptive. But actually in medicine, that was fairly detrimental. I remember having a conversation with uh, my wife's cousin, who's very senior in, in banking and is like really, really, really good with people. Mm. I said, look, I keep rubbing up against this problem. I find things that are stupid mm. and I try and fix them and it pisses everybody off. And I get annoyed that they're getting annoyed at me and not actually yeah. the actual thing. And his advice was like to be very political. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to listen to that. Mm. And then, and when I found out about, if an entrepreneur first, so I started reading about what they look for in their founders. And there was suddenly me looking at all these bits. And up until that point, I was like, how am I going to get a consultant job? I'm like really disruptive and I can't yeah. seem to like fit in any single department. And actually all of those elements, and you know this for yourself as a founder, become 
the foundation of, okay, I'm going to make something new and I'm going to change the world in a significant way or even non-significant way, but I'm going to give it a shot. And actually, that's the way that you constantly need to think. And when you're trying to do something new, which no one's done before, the group think is the worst thing that you can think because group think is wrong. Because if no one's ever done it before, there is no group other than people who've not done it and therefore didn't manifest it. So you can't listen to them. Um, so I don't know. I and mean, yeah, I've always just like, I guess, and then I go back to right, you know, need to be properly on the couch now. But when we were kids, like my family quite Catholic. So one of the things that we were taught about life from day one was A, a lot of scary stuff in Catholicism <laughs> about hell and sin and all this stuff. And actually, you know, my parents aren't that religious anymore, but in the day, that was, that was, a, that's actually a weird thing to learn. But the other thing I remember my dad said to me when we were kids was he's like, the point of life is not to be happy. And that is a very weird, I mean, I wouldn't say that to my kids now, but I remember that very concretely and thinking, well, if that's not the point, then what is the point of life? And all, and then I think that was part of the reason I went into medicine was because I was like, okay, well, if the point of life is not, you know, just singular enjoyment, then it has to be about purpose. And what's more, you know, what can you take with you into, because I was very obsessed with the afterlife at this time mm. of my life. Um, what can you take with you that's of value? And actually, you know, for medicine and lots of medics probably agree with me, like, one of the most purposeful things you can do is help somebody else, like save their life or improve their life or improve their quality of life or help them deal with a terrible time in their lives. And I think the purpose part is, is probably what's driven me through all of those things, always gravitating towards where I felt could sort of maximize my life. And then I think more granularly, like in the last three years, COVID hit, had like a very like strange time, founded a charity and like, like got controversially in the media quite a lot and pissed off comms teams all around the world. But also I think one of the really things that I think really crystallized in that moment was when I was redeployed to COVID ITU. I don't know if anyone remembers what we thought about COVID in the first couple of weeks. I don't know if you were in ITU at the time, but like it was very grim. Like we were expecting everybody to die. And some, some units were reporting like 90% mortality. Like it was crazy and we were doing these ward rounds with people that we were ventilating just ventilating and ventilating with kind of no real hope that they would get better we were just kind of waiting to see you know what would happen to them and we had a disproportionate amount of colleagues so we had nurses we had doctors kind of actually also including that group like bus drivers like public facing people who didn't have a choice of their work right in terms of being exposed and then here you are you've got people 30 years in the nhs 25 years in the nhs did you like your job don't know here you are now dying of a virus that no one had even heard of three months ago like what is that in terms of like life you just do not know where life would be and i think that was the most critical lesson i really like took to heart and interestingly most of those patients survived so if you know as we then found out if you ventilate someone for six to eight weeks with covid actually a lot of them tracky got off the unit and that was very very inspiring to see like you know you can persist and that's the other thing i learned about is persistence through the grimmest times but the, certainly, like I felt like I came out, not literally, or maybe one day literally, life too short, life is too short, tattooed across my chest, right? Because you just don't know. And if you're not doing something that, you know, fulfills that purposeful, or you, you're not even just a little bit, but maximizes your time on this planet, then, uh, you know, you're, you're, you don't have that time to waste, I think. And I think that's probably what drove all these nuts things was like i'm just going to give this a go because like if i don't then i might miss out on something super cool and that's basically been this almost constant mindset and i think what's really interesting actually is if you think about and i had this debate with my daughter actually the other day i said tell me something that's impossible because i was really interested in, in in her mindset and she was like well it's impossible to fly daddy i was like no it's not jetpacks she was like, oh, okay, yeah, well, uh, it's impossible to go to the bottom of the sea. And I was like, no, we've got submarines solved. Mm. I just I actually got quite irate. And then she said some strange things which actually were impossible. But the point was, there's a mindset around what we think is doable. And I think someone, I, think, I can't remember why I saw this now, but it's like 95% of what you think can't be done. It's just literally just in your head. And there's like a 5% kernel of things that are really, really hard and maybe, you know, you can't actually do because of physics or something. But most people never get past that 95%. And I think what's really interesting for me is like, that was like stripped away, you know, it was like, just try stuff and see what happens. And the more you try, the more you realize that most of it's in your head. You know, how can you build an AI controlling agent? Oh, I don't know. Let's, let's try. Like, what's the, what's this? Um, yeah. So the long rant, I hope you don't charge me too much for that. <laughs> Not at all. This is, yeah, it is this weird thing, isn't it? 
the sort of on the sort of entrepreneur's toolkit of curiosity, belief, and this sort of why not attitude all converging. And you definitely seem curious because of all these different moves that you've had and clearly what you're looking for. It sounds like you you were looking for something with all these different moves. And I can relate. I was too. Even in your story, you talk about being mixed race. I'm mixed race. I can understand the knowledge of du- duplicity and not feeling how you actually look. I'm, I'm white presenting, which is a phrase from the mixed community that actually I... S- I look white, but I'm not actually. And therefore in certain situations, I can feel something that I'm not meant to, or is different to what people might perceive. And that loneliness that comes along with it, but then the acceptance that you are okay not to feel what everyone is feeling, but then you're okay not to believe what everyone is believing. And that I can connect those dots too. that kind of contrarian nature that that builds within you because you are believing things to the contrary, you are acting things to the contrary, you are thinking things to the contrary, but everything seems fine and you're able to do that. It definitely does flex that contrarian muscle, I think, a lot more. In my experience too, that might not be the experience of other mixed people, but like certainly I can relate to that with you. And and that contrarian nature of curiosity, belief, etc. as an entrepreneur, I think it certainly helped me. I can't say it's hindered me. I think the contrarian muscle... That is a great phrase, right? Because everything that you do brain-wise is is exactly in the same way, muscle. You just do a little bit and do a little bit. Because some people are like, I've seen this like in really quite banal situations. I'm like, why don't we just do this? And they're like, oh, you can't do that. Why? And they're like, oh, I, 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 yeah, I guess we can. <laughs> and it's just, it's, you know, the mu- I think it's a contrarian muscle and maybe like a conformist muscle maybe. To like naturally think that the way things are done must be for a reason. And what, especially like big organizations in the NHS and stuff, you just dig down and down and down and you realize that actually these, these, especially institutional memory, most of it's either stupid or outdated or no one ever thought about it, you know. And people who were just like, oh yeah, we should just do this because this is what the guidance said. It was a really interesting, I can't remember who I found it, but there was something about uh, some guy took over a TV studio and he wanted to run two interviews back to back. And they said, you can't do that. Look, it's in the guidebook. You can't run two interviews back to back. We have to put a pre-recorded segment in the middle. And he was like, but why? This is like in the in the early 2000s. It's like, yeah, but why? And he was like, well, I don't know. So eventually what happened is he had to go all the way back to the person who wrote the guidebook in the 70s and said, well, why did you do this like this to have the pre-recorded segment? It's like, oh, yeah, in the 70s with the live tape, we used to have to feed it back again. So we needed a break to like rewind the spool. <laughs> and they hadn't used that technology for 20 years. And they were following that rule for another 40 years. And that's the kind of examples that if you look around the world, right, and accept, well, let's like, the, the, the easiest thought experiment is, do you think human beings are perfect? Obviously not. The, the society is just a construct of lots of human beings making decisions. Most of those decisions will be imperfect. Therefore, society is a construct or any institution or anything that's human made, therefore, is likely to have imperfection. Hmm. So you just have to reevaluate everything like constantly but again it's a muscle and it's also a bit tiring i suppose so if you're not used to constantly going oh well, what about this this is stupid because people go oh come on just dom just like accept something like what's wrong with you man mm. and then, yeah and again maybe it's not always the right thing to be so disruptive and you need you need people who can build and maintain as well like that's the way that you know societal makeup's made up but yeah i'm gonna steal that phrase contrarian muscle i really like that can you tell me about learning to code I, I, I don't want to go too much into this, but I do think that's a really interesting step. And I guess I'm not interested in like practically how you learn to code, but you talked about this feeling of, I guess, fr- the freedom, freedom that had been unlocked because all of a sudden, to quote you, you could now speak to computers and tell them what to do. You said something, I'm paraphrasing perhaps, but that unlocks a level of freedom to then express yourself through code and what computers can now do. So as an extension of what is in your mind, you can now extend that through computational techniques, etc. That, I think, is another, I guess, framework of the need to be disruptive or an entrepreneur or that kind of thing is that you're looking for freedoms. You're looking for freedoms to express yourself. And I f- also feel that too. Um, and so... Can you talk to me about that? 
Yeah, 100%. I think the freedom idea is really interesting because as most physicians probably will relate to, kind of being tortured by computer programs for like decades, yeah. right? Like we've enforced that you have to yeah. use this. Here's an audit, here's a form, here's a restriction, here's an email, like you know, here's 55 logins. Mm. <laughs> That's just the classic thing. So I think when I learned to code, um, I originally, so the plan originally was to go and do a PhD in applied AI in cardiology. And I applied... Uh, I think for the first cardiology PhD programs, February 2020, all the money, all the grants disappeared, like literally the next month. So that mm. was a non-starter. But the ability to code for me was, well, first of all, one of the, probably the hardest skill sets I've ever tried to acquire because I came to it quite late, having done, I guess, like trained muscle parts of my brain you know, decision-making, diagnostic, pragmatism, like, you know, I was a mm. sort of semi-senior cardiology reg. Absolutely. Most of my days were making life-saving decisions and, and doing procedures. And suddenly I'm confronted with a world which is extremely binary. You either get the code right or you don't. A lot of it is maths. And my maths had basically stopped at GCSE, so that was a big problem for me <laughs> to start with because I didn't really understand some of the basics of how you like functions and arrays. And I remember literally being in tears. So I, I started coding by doing using this Coursera course, which I would highly recommend actually. But just be warned if you're a medic, especially if you've not done this stuff before, the learning curve is incredibly steep. But on the other side of that is this great downhill. And actually with ChatGPT now and lots of the code aids, I think that's probably the, the curve up actually is much, 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 much shallower. But for me, I remember like crying in frustration that I couldn't work out why this function didn't work. Whereas now, I would take the code and I'd stick it in ChatGPT and be like, what's wrong with this? And they'd be like, oh, you forgot to put this dot here. And I'd be like, oh my God, thanks so much. That's taking me three hours of my life away. But it was also, I think, a really, it free, certainly freedom and autonomy to code. So I had an idea to build an app. This is how I got into EF or I was thinking about the code originally. And I managed to code an entire prototype in Python for this digital app that sort of took photos and used AI and did a bunch of stuff. And it like looked really ugly because I hadn't got around to learning sure. how to do any user end, interface yeah. stuff. But it worked. I think as soon as it starts working, you get like this constant cycle of what else can I do? What more can mm -hmm. I learn? Like it pulls you in. I'm quite into DIY action. It's exactly the same feeling. I want to understand the basic. And I, I had the same experience with DIY, funnily enough. Crying tears of frustration, trying it's to a drill freedom. a hole in a wall for about three hours, but not realizing it was a screwdriver. Yep. That was my problem then. I was like, yeah. I was like what's going on? But I think the freedom is especially important for those of us in careers, you know, medicine especially, where, the, you know, it's, it's a train track. I mean, you basically start the train day one of medical school. And for the majority of people, you, you never get off, you know, past consultancy into retirement. You've just done that train journey, hit a few stations along the way, maybe a few track changes here and there. But otherwise, you're kind of going and doing the same thing. And the choice of your day, especially in the emergency specialty, is almost entirely taken away from you. You, you, you just kind of do what you know you can react to. And that, I think that works for some people. I think for me, the biggest issue that I had was like when I tried to change things, there were all these things that, you know, for, for patients benefit, but actually the systems wouldn't allow mm. us to change or the resources wouldn't allow us to train them. And the, the apathy just got more and more. And that's a big problem now as mm. well. Apathy to everything. Um, especially in the profession that's so burnt out. So change becomes even harder, ironically, um, mm. as it becomes more needed. But I think the other thing it unlocks is it just unlocks that the idea that you could just sit down, think about something, and, and, and develop it even 50 or 60% of the way from idea to product. And, and we talk about it a little bit, but with AI, you can probably get even like 90% of the way now actually, in terms of building product and building things that work. So it unlocks in the world of technology for professionals the ability to actually con you know, massively reduce the loop from mm -hmm. I need this, I have this thing that does that. You can almost actually get there entirely yourself. And I'm not saying you need to go and find a company to do it anymore. Either. Actually, interestingly, I don't think you even do need to do that, at least for some of the basic stuff that you might want to do. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the world of 10 years, 20 years time where software is as sort of manipulable as, as Lego. Like you could literally just buy a software kit and anyone can make anything. Mm. I think that'd be a fascinating for what happens to professions and how we do professional work. Yeah. That's very fascinating. A few minutes ago, you said that you now believe that all doctors will work alongside AI and you didn't believe that 
six or seven months ago. What has happened in six or seven months? Well, so interesting, I go back a bit further, is my the, the scepticism journey. I saw that some money went to AI, I can't remember now, 2018, 2019, something like that. And I was so scathing. I was like, how can you spend money on AI when the computers don't work? And interestingly, what I've just like actually realized in the, at least the last six, seven months is, well, even so about a year ago, I started playing with GPT-3. And the first thing I was like, another aha moment after coding was using AI technologies to do clinical work. And not like in a clinical setting, but just even I was shocked at the level of clinical knowledge that was already encoded. And this, just remember, this is two generations back from what we have now. Mm. Um, it's GPT-3, not, not chat GPT or GPT-4. Mm. And I was like, well, this is, this is game-changing technology, even to do some of the most basic function like write letters summarize notes i mean these are these are things that whole companies are being spun up now but i think the other thing that i kind of realized is we've seen incredible progress on one axis in how advanced these models are and in the other axis the the cost has dropped precipitously you know i think gpt3 the cost if i remember correctly have dropped about 60 percent every three months for the past nine months or something like that like it's a ridiculous like it's properly trending towards electricity now Therefore, the world requires that these models become more advanced and cheaper and therefore will become part of the fabric. And in healthcare, the thing that's changed my mind and made this inevitable is actually some of the early work that we started to do where we started to use in our earliest prototypes AI to just do very, very basic tasks. And I'll give you a really good example of this. So one of the things that we get, and we'll talk about this in a second, but we get our AI to do is to summarize a consultation and write your draft letter for you. And when we started testing this, we were kind of shocked at, A, how bad physicians uh, performing the, so we do a test where they essentially have to do an outpatient consult with an AI assistant and without. And without the AI assistant, A, it took them about twice as long. But B, the quality of the outputs that they produced sometimes was terrible. In fact, in one case, someone was like, I just can't be bothered. They just didn't do a letter at the end, right? That was a task. They were like, I just can't be bothered. No letter. And then on the other side, the AI let produce letters that are consistent, about two pages long all the time, have notes to the patient. And the reason being is very simple. If you give a set amount of data to a human being and you say, write a paragraph, that takes them about five minutes. And if you say, write four paragraphs, it takes them about or me, about 15 minutes, maybe. But for an AI, you give that paragraph, it's about 10 seconds. Two pages, it's about 12 seconds. So the delta is two seconds. So the effort to the quality that you produce means that it's easy to make healthcare much safer. And as soon as I realized that, I was like, well, this is a luxury today, but this will become a requirement very, 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 very quickly. As soon as you start seeing AI produce documentation that is safer, patients understand, everybody else <laughs> understands actually. And you just have less, you know, we all know that most malpractice insurance sues are from communication issues. So even using AI at the most basic, basic, basic level, just to draft, not to do anything autonomously or clinical decision support or anything, all of which is great, but I don't necessarily believe it. But for this particular element of it. And then that's why I think, you know, our ethos as a company, in fact, is to kind of use AI, not to do anything clever. At all. Like, you know, you've got companies out there that are now using AI to design proteins, which is awesome. Like, that's great. But interestingly for me is a classic example of like this dichotomy of technology and healthcare, right? And the best, and this was crystallized for me when I was working on CRISPR gene editing. So I worked on the CRISPR trial for TTR amyloidosis, consented a guy to have gene editing to switch off TTR amyloidosis for him forever, right? Amazing breakthrough in human technology. On the same day, Another guy, same condition, TTR amyloidosis, admitted to hospital heart failure because he ran out of frusamide and couldn't get hold of his GP. Oof. Same condition, you know, and like the levels of technology in those, those circumstances. That is fascinating. But isn't that interesting, right? That, that everyone's focused on like, how can we find new AI targets? And I'm like, yeah, forget that. Why doesn't this guy never run out of frusamide? Like, why don't we just start with that? Like, that would be a much more impactful today use of AI than anything that we can do at the top end, which most people will never even experience or use, mm. was the, the stupid stuff. So our idea is like we take AI and we just fix the stupid things, at least to start with, of which so many stupid things. 
you know. I think Eric Topol showed a paper a couple of weeks ago. 800,000 deaths from medical diagnostic errors in the US, right, every year. And I kind of think that's an underestimate from what, you know, from clinical and professional experience, at least maybe, you know, not capturing the morbidity element of that. I've seen it professionally. I've seen it personally as well. A couple of family members uh, seriously harmed. Uh, one died from medical oh, errors. Sorry. And stupid ones as well. You know, red flag symptoms missed, doses tripled for 12 months instead of one. You know, this it's just a nonsense, right? Um, and that's why I think it's, it will become mandatory because co-working with something that's just looking over your shoulder and being like nah that's dumb don't do mm. that just even once a day <laughs> like, like a life-saving intervention yeah um so yeah that's why i think the future so as a means of i guess framing what you're up to now and actually addressing what you've just talked about with the morality behind this you talked about a moral imperative mm. actually in the run-up to this and something that is I guess increasingly coming up as this as a as a sort of pressure and a conversation that I think really needs to be had is this element this notion this question is it unethical not to be using AI currently at least in some areas can you answer that mm. for me yes 100% I mean it's it's unequivocal right I mean I'm not It is a simple it feels it feels that simple to me also yeah, but, but it, I think the, it's the devil's really in the detail, perhaps. The devil's in the detail, exactly. So I think people automatically jump to AI as a data model, which actually is interesting in terms of bias and predictive models. And people have always focused on the wrong end, I think, in terms of what we can do with AI. And large language models, to be fair, only recently unlocked most of the actual nub of medicine, which is the language. You know, medicine is a language. It's a, you know, you tell me your symptoms, I make up a story. From that story, I reach inside, find other stories about evidence that I know. I don't understand those papers or how Ramapril works, but I know the story that Ramapril is there for heart failure, so that's why I prescribe you Ramapril. And that's how doctors work, right? We're language-based agents in, in, the, in the parlance of the industry. But people always think that AI is like, oh, it's going to diagnose you and it's going to make predictions and we're going to act on those predictions. But A, I think the diagnosis thing is really hard from a medical legal perspective because who's going to take responsibility for the mistakes that it will make, right? It'll never be perfect because it's an imperfect system. Human beings, as we talked about, imperfect. And the prediction stuff is even more laughable because nobody, before we had AI, could really do anything useful with any predictive model. And I challenge almost anyone to find me something in medicine that someone's made a prediction where you were like, oh yeah, that was a useful prediction. And there's some exceptions to that, maybe like grace and heart and maybe some of the sepsis stuff. But most of the stuff that had come out, nobody ever tried to, A, validate that you could do something useful prospectively with it. And I know this because I worked on some of the cardiac arrest scores, like Miracle 2 was one of my... Uh, like very early paper contributions. Um, and that's for, for cardiac arrest. But if you look at the scores of how people decide, you know, if you look at the scoring system for if someone's going to survive for a cardiac arrest, for example, and there's a whole bunch of scores that you can you can have a look at. But the way that derived is all retrospectively. So they say, you know, your lactate was eight on arrival and your downtime was 30 minutes and therefore you have X chance of of dying. But what's, what people miss is like they, those are the exact elements that I make a decision whether or not we're going to continue CPR. What is your lactate? What was your downtime? And then I stop if they're above a threshold in my brain. Therefore, it's a fundamentally biased way of recording. All you're doing is recording what's actually happening. You're not predicting anything. And this is a really good example of this because at the same time that I was running uh, the Heart Attack Center as one of the reg on calls a couple of years ago, my wife was the trauma reg at one of the other London hospitals and she was seeing guys who got stabbed in the chest coming in, 16, 17 year olds, with like lactates of like nine or 10. She was like, oh, that's all right. Yeah, we just took it to their fine. I was like, well, I just like stopped uh, assassinating this 80 year old with a lactate of five because we thought that was too high. And she was like, what? And I was looking at her going, what? And we were like, well, what are we doing? Like, are we making these decisions based on anything? Uh, AI in, the, in that space is, it, it suffers from the same problems that we've always had in medicine. It's like we don't actually sometimes fund think about what we're, you know, the data, how the data translates. But on the, on the, on the simple end, you know, we spend, it may be a good time to actually say what the, ta mm, the tortoise please. does, and then I can explain to you how this, some of these thoughts come from. So our thesis essentially is, if this is the easiest way to boil it down, human beings, fallible, medicine practiced by humans, 
medicine is therefore fallible. Like we expect errors, right? It's part of the system. It's baked in. People make mistakes. We don't like to talk about it. We have serious incident reports, but everybody kind of accepts that people make mistakes. We try and stop it. But what if human beings plus AI is infallible? Therefore, medicine practiced by that combination, and I do stress it is a combination, perhaps medicine could be infallible and we could get rid of all those errors. So our idea is that we would give every clinician some form of artificial intelligence. And what we decided to do, which is, I guess, our risk as a deep tech company, is use the technology that Chris had already sort of been looking at, which was this computer controlling agent, because that's where most of medicine actually is done now in digital environments. The recording and the recall of information, the prescribing, all of that's now digital. Therefore, if we give the tools to an AI to use that system to read and write to any system, solves interoperability, which is a huge problem. But actually, it's just a sensible place for the AI to sit, like in between you and the computer. So we started testing this, and we tested it just on admin. So we stayed away from the medical device side for now. And as I said before, I'm, I'm super like unimpressed by diagnostic predictive algorithms anyway. Um, and we built an AI tool that essentially sits on top of your EMR. And actually, in the limit, can be any EMR. We've taught it to use a few now. And just does all the paperwork for you for outpatients. So you're pre-charting, finding the notes, uh, recording the consultation using speech to text, doing a letter and a note sort of generated off the back of that, then ordering your tests and ordering your follow up appointments. And that's it. It's a repetitive workflow that we all do. It takes about 10 minutes per patient when it really shouldn't. And the clinician has to do it. So we started testing this, um, saying, well, what is the workflow now? How much time do you spend? And if we add an AI, what's the, you know, w- what does that look like? And the obvious things are it saves more time because all half of the tasks are done in parallel. You know, your pre-chart's done for you, the notes are already there, the letter just needs editing, the tests are sort of ordered, you just sort of check them. That makes sense, 60% faster, roughly. But then we started thinking, well, what else can we measure? So we measure quality of documentation. That kind of doubles for this kind of work, and that's increasingly something that we're finding uh, in lots of the literature that's out there now. And then we were like, okay, well, what else can we measure? So we started measuring cognitive load. And I've always been really annoyed. It's like, why do I get so annoyed when I open CERN or when I open Epic or any of these really complicated EHRs? I remember once I was using Epic and I tried to delete as many buttons as possible. And I highly recommend it because it nearly worked and I was making, it looked really nice to use. But then I deleted one button that I couldn't get back and suddenly I couldn't look at anyone's blood and it was a bit of a disaster. And IT were like, what did you do? Like, how did you do this? I was like, I don't even know. Like, I'm so sorry. I can't, I ruined my instance. But so cognitive load. So we use something called NASA Task Load Index. We just basically ask people how frustrating and how difficult was the task before and after. And we found that we can basically see a reduction of about 60-70% in terms of cognitive load when you're using a system like this. Because all you have to then do without touching the keyboard is just do what you were trained to do at medical school. Just talk to the patient and practice medicine in the way that mm. you thought you would practice medicine as opposed to you know the typing of the screen. And I think that's actually where a whole bunch of safety comes from. If you're having a good day, and again, this is maybe something only medics really relate to, but I spent a lot of time finding a good pen. This was slightly Mm. before digital. And the reason I spent so much time is I recognized that I was a better physician when I enjoyed writing Mm. my notes. If I had a good pen, I would enjoy it. I'd be like, yeah, I write some more notes and think about this, add some more to the plan. What a great plan I've written. And whether or not that was actually the case, but the mentality, and it's exactly the same, like it's the whole game of medicine, especially at the more senior level, is played in your own brain. Mm. But what we do is we just overload our brains with so much mm. rubbish, like all these EHR nonsense, people come and distract you. You know, I used to used to find the, um, you know, the, the do not disturb pinnies that they'd wear on the nursing ground to do the pharmacy. A, it was laughable how effective that is. Like, it's actually really, really effective. Like, I think 40% less errors or something. It's like mad. But B, we're like, oh, yeah, don't disturb those people. They're doing something important. But feel free to disturb anyone else in the hospital, including, like, walking. My wife said someone walk into theater the other day just started talking to her. She was literally operating. And I was like, what planet would people think that's acceptable in terms of risk? So this idea that our brains are just this infinitely malleable thing and we can multitask, it's not even true. Human beings can't even multitask. So giving an AI to take over all of that, I think, is where a lot of the is a lot of the, where the basic wins will come from and will be required. And then later on, it'll be things like, oh, you said you were going to order this x-ray. Can you just order it, for example? Like really basic reminders of when good care you know, the different, I mean, you were an ITU doctor, right? So you realize this, like most of good care is actually just doing all the basics all the time. 
Correct. And, you know, the, the one or two times someone walks in with like a house like diagnosis that changes the game. I can remember mm. literally two examples of that in my entire career. Whereas I can give you thousands of examples where someone missed something little and it caused real harm. Mm. And I think that's, that's, the, that's, so when I go back to your answer about will AI, unequivocally, yes. Like if, as soon as you realize this technology can like plug in all these stupid holes that we have in the system without even very much lift at this point, it becomes a, mm. not even just a no-brainer. Like how quick do we do this? Because mm. every day we don't, people are actually die. One of the most interesting things you said there, it was a lot that was interesting, but one of the most interesting that stuck out for me was this, the fact that you measure cognitive load and you use something, I believe you said NASA, what was it? The NASA, NASA task, load task load index. And you saw a reduction of 60 to 70%. Now, perhaps this is my own ignorance. I've actually not heard of that before. And I've not heard anyone talk to me about that before. We had to go and find it, right? Because if you like trying, I mean, we, we're trying to write a paper like now about the, yeah. the impact of EHRs and cognitive load and the paucity of evidence. We've we've digitized the whole place. But has anyone really started? I mean, some people have, but to some degree. What did adding a computer screen into the consultation add? What did it take away? What did the keyboard add? What did it take away? You know, and we haven't really looked at it holistically. And we, we keep going, we need more structured data. We need more structured data. Actually, why don't we just have more time with patients to like talk to them? And then they feel they've been heard and they actually feel that like they've made a, you know, a, mm. a connection. And that's, that's probably the most thing, single value add. Mm. And I think this is what really annoys me about a lot of the system is that if you look at any healthcare system in the world, the fundamental unit is the patient doctor consultation. Everything else is a derivative of that. The referrals, the diagnostic avenue, the treatment pathway, you name it. It came from a decision that was made, which was essentially boiled down to history examination investigation, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look, and this is why our agent's called Osler. So William Osler said, listen to the patient. They are telling you what is wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And what he meant was most of the correct diagnosis comes from the history alone. And actually, in, in it was 150 years ago, there was like no investigations or imaging. So to be fair, like that was mostly the case. And there wasn't even really stethoscope. But actually, that study has been repeated. It was repeated lo most recently in 2012. 78%, 80% of the correct diagnosis comes from the history alone. And yet, as a society of medical professionals globally for the last 20 years, all we've done is mess with the history, right? We've reduced the time, we've introduced keyboards and screens, we've reduced our diagnostic skill sets, we've relied very heavily on tests, which are mostly useless anyway. And if you look at AI, which gets super annoying, almost all AI is focused on radiology. But actually in those same studies, that only really shifts the shifts the needle for any patient by in about 10% of cases. Therefore, even if you're going to make massive gains in improving radiology diagnosis, which we also haven't done, you're only going to move the needle for everyone by about 1% or 2%. And that's probably why AI has fallen flat for like the last 10 years. It's just been looking in the wrong place. But large language models unlock the history. And that's where I'm fascinated to see even the small wins there would be massive. You know, massive. Mm. Yeah. And I think with the cognitive load data metric, mm. that is a way of turning into qualitative and quantitative arguments for the best technologies versus the worst technologies when you think about the workforce crisis that we have. Because actually, when I think back to... I'll give you a really stupid example, right? Really stupid example. That pen thing that you just mentioned, like that is <laughs> lighting things off in my brain like there's no tomorrow. Like I, That gives me like flashbacks of like one of those pens that's really like gritty and is almost like cutting through the paper as you write with it. And it's the only pen I've got because like, when are you ever going to see a pen on the side of anything? And you've been expected to conduct an entire ward round at pace with someone telling you what's going on and you have to make sure all of this written down and you that anxiety is ludicrous. So, yeah. but, but the, the cognitive load associated with just a bad pen I then think back to the cognitive load to now what happens when you extrapolate that to a bad piece of technology that requires too much training and actually that bit of extra time that it takes. Well, yeah. without this metric, without this, this, 
this cognitive load metric, I'm really only talking about time. Well, what if the time is negligible? How can I really make my argument that this technology isn't very good? Like it might be giving me some time back, but it's not good for a reason I can't explain. This is actually giving me a, a framework to actually explain that, which I think is really interesting. And when we're in a time where the workforce is so stretched and leaving, like ugh, there's literally no tomorrow, there's something in that for me. Like, is is that a metric that's used? Have you seen this used often, like a lot in health tech and our industry? Is this something no. that is plugged a lot? Like, I, mean, I feel like it should be. The origin of it came from, I mean, there are some UX, UI, you know, usability metrics sure. for product. Sure. Um, but they don't really uh, express themselves well in an industry where you know your brain is the fundamental unit of value mm. uh, of product diagnosis. So obviously NASA used this because they wanted to design their system so astronauts didn't lose concentration and blow the spaceship up. Mm. Um, and I think it's been used in a few other places before. I, I, if I'm honest with you, I can't actually remember how we came across it other Not than sure. a I love saying NASA all the time yep. in my actual Close, workplace. Yeah. So that's awesome. B, it, was, it seemed to be relatively well validated in the literature. And I think it's it, actually that's really interesting because it speaks to one of the core principles of what we're trying to do at Tortoise, which is partly why we're called Tortoise, is like a lot of this stuff is just basic science. Like, you know, for example, when we're trying to look for a metric to describe this phenomenon, let's go and look in the scientific literature and see what we can find and then use that in our actual product. And that's mm. exactly what we went to go and do. Like, it's a slow way around of doing it rather than making up product or just marketing. Because I think a lot of people miss a trick that, you know, and then maybe I'll come on to this in my CEO things, but like you do actually have to build something that's good. And I think one of my biggest worries was like, how do I know this is good? And obviously as, you know, as a medic and the science background and academic, I, don't, I actually only know one way of analyzing anything, whether it's good. And that's essentially the, you know, the scientific methodology mm. and clinical trial framework. So using that in this sense made a lot of sense for us. But then equally, I can say hand on heart, what is the evidence that this works? And actually, that's a question that a lot of decision makers who think the same way, physician in our field specifically, CCOs, CMOs, that's how they think. Mm. Where's the evidence that this works? Why why isn't this just vaporware like we see a hundred times a day? And that's that's the tech industry. I said, well, why don't we approach it more from like a clinical trial health industry? And interestingly, in terms of like regulation, which is obviously the big question mark for AI and healthcare, I think it's only gonna it's gonna end up in the same bucket as pharma especially as it becomes more and more powerful what we can do with ai and how we constrain it and how we validate it and how we regulate it we have a framework for this already and that's you know 60 years of clinical trials which i was one of my like my job for like two years so we just decided to just start using that as a framework and at least you know then you're building evidence with what you're doing which is again a lot of the companies they go very fast but they don't build the evidence mm. they're like the hair in the fable mm -hmm. tortoise in the hair and our idea is that Go slow, collect the evidence, and and ultimately win, which obviously is the goal. And on that note, whereabouts are you guys now? So, as a company, uh, in terms of I don't know, product build or sales or scale or what series you've raised, etc. Talk to me about where you're at now. Yeah, so we're about nine months old. Uh, we started out in EF, um, backed by EF, got the pre-seed funding from then, had a, had a bit of an angel round, went out and tried to raise a seed in January, spectacularly failed. <laughs> Come back to that, but highly recommend failure as a, uh, as a learning tool if you're paying attention. And then went away, built some more stuff, developed some hostel partnerships. We have about three or four now in the UK. Oh, nice. One or two in the US, uh, our companies. Mm. And that, yeah, that's been super useful because how does the CFO think about AI? You know, it's a real question that we yep. didn't really have any answer to. How does the CCO think? What is the overlap? What is the dichotomy, right? What is the difference? Um, and I think those questions for how, because the, the thing that we're trying to build is computationally very, very expensive. At least it is for today. Therefore, we have to find a place in the world where we can make it fit with the market as it is today and the mm. market as it will be in five years. So that's been quite an interesting journey. We then did manage to raise seed May of this year. So we raised four and a half million dollars in seed and team of seven now. If you're based in Holborn or any of your listeners want to come down and try Osler, uh, we're in a London office at the moment. There's about seven or eight of us now, I think, four engineers, operations and uh, and some and well actually about three or four compliance agencies so interestingly the biggest thing that we've done in terms of spend has been on compliance uh, which is not something you hear a startup say right? but we realized that again it's not an industry uh, unfortunately but interestingly like if you do it from the beginning 
the cost in terms of time, opportunity, and what you build is much lower. It's just like, we want to build this. And they're like, no, you can't do that. I was like, yeah, but what if we did it like this? And they're like, oh, I give it a go. So product-wise, we have a, a Scribe tool out now, which is our tool set, and anybody can go and play with it. It's at scribe.tortoise.ai, so you can have a play. That's not really our core product. It's just how we're sort of assessing the tools and benchmarking them for safety. Again, something we've had to go and work out how to do. How do you work out the accuracy rate for speech to text? How do you work out accuracy for large language models? It doesn't really exist in philosophical setting. We'll probably end up publishing a lot of that work. But the main agent sort of trying to deploy in our first hospital in the next three months um, and then looking for extended pilots in various settings, community, looking at some back office stuff as well, because that's obviously a big problem. Uh, and then looking for the footprint in the US is the plan over the next year. Amazing. Are you still practicing at all? Trying to. Um, so I'm thinking of this as like my extended PhD. So I kind of left proper clinical medicine and I left my pharma job in September because before that I was running heart failure trials and quite enjoying that. I would say to anyone coming into the industry, especially if you want to sort of work at the clinical call phase like we do, like in terms of like building an agent for clinical care, you kind of need to keep practicing. So I've been trying to like keep my hand in doing random bank shifts and locums and stuff, but with family and on calls mm. and stuff, it's very difficult. Um, and I don't know how a lot of PhD people do it, actually, because I've already been pretty rusty. I've only been out for mm. about six months. Um, I probably need to like go back and try and remember the which way around the stethoscope goes and echo and all the rest of it. <laughs> um, but I, I think you do have to stay. And I think you do have to stay in just as a reality check. You know, yeah. is this stuff needed? Is this yes. actually how everything works? And you'd be shocked, at, with the, again, in terms of like muscle memory, how that stuff dissipates really, really quickly. I mean, it comes back really quickly as well, but do you have to keep it fresh? And I think if you're very junior and you haven't done a lot of medicine, I would highly advise not just dropping it uh, if you go into tech because you kind of then are a jack of no trades, right? You don't really have, you know, a lot of medical experience. You, you, know, you have a biology degree more or less, but you don't have the experience and you're not really a tech person. And you see people going to product and stuff and actually that might become more and more of an industry for clinicians. So I think this clinician engineer role is becoming very interesting as engineering power, you know, to, to obtain that power becomes easier. Clinicians in that role is, is super useful. But the edge that gives you a doctor, maybe actually what people really enjoy, is the doctoring. As long as you can find a way to continue enjoying it, then you should definitely try and keep it. And that's, that's actually generally something I miss. I mean, I do miss hanging out with patients and making diagnoses. And there's a simplicity to it, I think, that... You know, this current system definitely gets in the way of, don't get me wrong, but like fundamentally it is still, uh, yeah, it's still a great job and I do miss it. How do you find being a leader, a founder, a CEO versus, I guess, a similar role, but in a cardiology team? What do you find the differences with tech versus being in a hospital? There are probably people that might look, be looking to do something similar, might be in a team in one place, but thinking, hey, there might be a leader within their organization, their company, they might be in corporate, they might be in medicine, they might be in lots of different places that might not consider it transferable, let's say. So oh, I lead people in mm. my team at work, but I don't know, the leadership of a CEO of a startup scares me. I'm interested in, in how you see those two things in that context. Yeah, it's interesting. I suppose for, I mean, for me, I don't see the vast. I think autonomy, I think, would be the main difference. And actually, you, so when you're a leader in, a, in an organization, like 50% of your role, 60% of your role is like keeping the lights on, right? It's like making sure that whatever's coming down is being delivered, you know, policies, protocols, making sure everyone's happy and doing their work. And, you know, kind of what you're doing is kind of set and it's your job to like keep the train rolling down the tracks. The difference in CEO land is like there is no light. And in sometimes, you know, this sounds like really weirdly uh, esoteric now, but you have to be the light, especially when you're a very short, like very small team. You can often be like, is this even a thing? Like, are we even doing anything? Like, what's happening? But you have to have this crazy level of conviction that what you're doing exists and is real and is actually useful and grounded in reality. And I think the conviction to, to maintain that is actually really hard. It can actually be quite lonely as well. That you can feel that, you know, you have to believe this thing singularly. Otherwise, nobody will believe it. And then the company just dissipates. And I, I think you have the reliability, you know, you have the extended structure to, to sort of rely on in, in an organization. But otherwise, you know, the fundamentals are more or less 
exactly the same. You know, you have to know your people. You have to understand what they're good at, what they're not good at. You have to make sure that you convey why something's important and what you know what what exactly that we're all aspiring to. And then you know, as I, as I can't remember who said it now, but you have to keep the trains running. Um, and it's your job in any situation to be like, this is the job, this is the work. Did the work get done? And it, a lot of it is no more complicated than that. Like, just define what you're trying to do. Did we do it? No. Well, why not? And can we do it? Like, that's it. <laughs> it's not actually, you know. And I think the 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 fun bit, I suppose, is the autonomy. You know, you you kind of can wander wherever you want to go. But the terrifying bit is the autonomy, because when you get there, you're like, "What the hell is this? I don't want to go here." Like, what? But there's no one to blame other than yourself, and I think that's the that's the, the double edged sword, really, of of the, being in a startup. I think Paul Graham said, uh, "Startups are exercises in de-risking uncertainty," and I think that's exactly how it feels. It's not a company; like, there's no rules. It's not a bakery. You, know, you don't just buy some flour, make some cookies, and start selling them. You kind of have to say, "I think this is a thing." And I'm going to try to like work out if it is a thing as fast as possible before we run out of money. And trying try to convince people to come on that journey with you, I guess, is the other main difference. Like, if you want to employ me to come and be part of my accounting team at Vodafone, fine. You know, that's like that's a job, that's a company, there's benefits, whatever. Now, come and join the same team, but we're trying to build an AI computer controlling agent for healthcare, and we don't even know if it is possible, let alone market feasible or you know everyone's going to actually want it people are like mm. but then actually having said that there is a subset of people who'd be like yeah let's do that that sounds great let's give it a crack and that's the people that you want for that kind of team so i guess team building is also uh, a big difference like mm. the, the people that you want on your bus to go off piste with uh are very different maybe to the sort of reliable people that you want to to go down the tracks with i guess that's the way to put it final question for me mate before we wrap up um You've got a unique view of the space with your clinical work, with the your knowledge of technology, the fact that you are an entrepreneur building a company as well. You've got a lot of experience across pharma. You mentioned CRISPR. There's a lot that you know from both the knowledge, but also practicality level too. Like you've done a lot with your career. What are you excited about? right now when you think of the next whether you want to say year five years ten years and i know obviously tortoise is a huge part of that perhaps it's what you're going to achieve with tortoise and where you see that longer term vision but i'm interested like what's a reason for me or anyone else to be excited right now with everything that you are part of and that you know yeah, I think I can maybe crystallize that into a really nice moment we had. So someone came to use the system, the, like the super prototype system, about three or four months ago. And for some reason, they just happened to be in London. So they didn't fly from Canada for this, but they were in London from the Canadian position. And quite old, like nearly close to retirement. And I watched him use the system to do the consultation. And then he sort of finished uh, and he went to use the computer. And then he went, oh, and he was just sort of done, mm. you know? And I, I literally watched that burden disappear. And it was, you know, he'd done his job like he wanted to do. He'd made a consultation, made a diagnosis. Yeah. And that was it. And I think actually what excites me the most is watching physicians who've only ever really experienced this as a sort of mixed bag of the great clinical bit and then the terrible admin bit where I just have to get through it. Just actually see what their lives are like if they just did the great clinical bit so when i was a, a locum reg as a cardiologist between cmt and a bit, bit rogue to just step up to locum reg as cardiology but that's kind of what i did um i didn't have a login to the computer for three and a half months um because they just kept renewing my contract no one ever gave me a login so i used to take one of the f1 well in fact one f1 for the ward and one f1 for referrals mm. but i saw 35 patients a day like i was an absolute machine mm. and i loved every minute of it like there was not a single minute of that job which I was not like super happy, even though I was getting 55 bleeps Brilliant. and running all around this terrible hospital. Good for you. And I think that's the experience that we all wanted. And to like to see people get to actually have that and to like bring that into the profession, I think that's the bit that, yeah, can't wait. I love that, mate. That, at, the, at the end of the day, so much of this is a people game. We talk about technology a lot. We're in health tech. This is a people game. The problems to be, sol problems to be solved right now are putting 
the human back into healthcare. And this is what we are trying to, people like yourself are trying to do. And people like myself are trying to evangelize. It's, it's relieving people that are helping other people of their burdens to allow them to practice at the top of their license, to allow them to practice the quality of medicine that they want to deliver. And that's the game. And I fully support what you guys are up to. And I think it is awesome. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. If people want to learn more about what you are up to, um, what is the best way for them to do so? Uh, yeah, if you just go on our website, tortoise, so T O R T U S, spelt wrong for the SEO, dot AI. That's uh, got a lot of information about what we're doing, but there's also a clinician access. So if you want to come down and try it, if you're based in London or you know visiting London, you can come and try the system. And we have physicians come and try every day. And there's also the the scribe tool. If you're in the US, you can use it live, or you can just mess about with it. And that's both accessible through the website. Dom, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks so much for having me.